the, the failure of the sons and grandson of Josiah, that great reformer uh, whom we considered last evening. This is where we are up to in the chronology of the kings. We're right down at the end of the history of Judah. And when you step in a little closer, we have 23 years of chaos and instability because of the apostasy and wickedness of the sons of Josiah. They were so diverse from their father, it's hardly possible to imagine how that happened. But with a father like that, how did that happen? Well, because of the deep-seated apostasy that had been instilled in that people by Manasseh and then promoted again by Josiah's father, Ammon, for two years. It was so deep-seated, so endemic in that people, that there was no hope for most of them. There was hope for a few, as we saw last evening. Those who would go off to Babylon, of course, would have opportunities to recover themselves. And there was that little close band that was around Josiah, who maintained their faith to the end. But it was a time of great chaos and instability in the ecclesia of God of that day. I'd like you, if you would, to join me as we begin today in 2nd of Kings at chapter 23. There's something here that we need to note as we come to consider the, the death of Josiah. Uh, evidently, in uh, 609 BC, the time of the Battle of Carchemish, now, Carchemish is right up there. You can see that, that red dot <coughs> up here. It's uh, on the border, actually, as I mentioned last evening. It's on the border between Syria and Turkey. And we went there. There's a little town called Gerabolus. You can look from Gerabolus over the way. You can't take pictures uh, up close to the border because the, the driver said, no, 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 no picture, no photo, uh, because there's people on the other side with guns and they, uh, they're, they're not all that friendly so um, it, there's a bit of danger looking out over Carchemish now Carchemish played a huge role in the, in the development of the empires of Nebuchadnezzar's image and this was where Nebuchadnezzar showed his true colours as a general of his father's army, his father was the king at the time and Nebuchadnezzar became king in 606 BC so 609, the, the, the time of the Battle of Carchemish in the year of the death of Josiah, he was getting towards that point where he would take over the reins of Babylon and he was showing how, how good a general he was in the, in the field of battle. Now if you're with me in 2 Kings 23, let's have a look at verse 29. <coughs> it says this, In his days, and of course this is the, the days of Josiah, in his days, Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, went up against the king of Assyria to the river Euphrates. And King Josiah went against him, and he slew him at Megiddo when he had seen him. His servants then carried him in a chariot from Megiddo back to Jerusalem, and they buried him in his own sepulchre. And, and so the people replaced Josiah with the second oldest son, Jehoahaz, and we mentioned the reason for that. The reason for that was that Jehoiakim was so notoriously evil that the people didn't want him. He was a 25-year-old. He was uh, corrupt. His brother wasn't much better, but he was the, the lesser of two evils. And we're going to see that as we proceed. And so we have this record of, and it says there in the record, did you notice? In his days, Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, went up against the king of Assyria. Now that's not correct. If you are using the King James Version, you need to make a correction here. Because that is not what happened. That is not true. This is what we should read there. And the RSV, which I think there's a couple of them sitting on the tables in front of me, the RSV will tell you what the correct translation should be. It reads, in his days, in Josiah's days, Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, went up to the king of Assyria, to the river Euphrates. And that's because it was Necho's intention to support the failing, fading kingdom of Assyria against the rising power of Babylon, which was now led by Nebuchadnezzar. 
as the general of their army. So this is the, the history. And of course, uh, <coughs> if you just come down to verse 33 of 2 Kings 23, it says, And Pharaoh Necho put him... And we, we might step back, verse 31. Jehoahaz was 20 and 3 years old when he began to reign. He reigned three months in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hamutal, a daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. He did that which was evil in the sight of Yahweh, according to all that his fathers had done. And Pharaoh Necho put him in bands at Riblah. Now, can you recall? Uh, that this, is, this is a popular place, isn't it? Because Nebuchadnezzar was to use Riblah on the Orontes, on the origin of the Orontes River, which you saw pictures of uh, uh, last evening or the evening before. And this was obviously a, a, a good place to, to have an army based so that you could, you could uh, uh, further your operations in that area. So here we've got that reference of even Pharaoh Nico choosing Ribla as his base of operations. But, but, but he takes, he, he sends back to Jerusalem and he takes Jehoahaz off the throne and brings him up to Ribla and then, of course, later on, takes him back down to Egypt, where he dies in ignominy. Now, this, uh, this is interesting, isn't it? Because it's obvious in the plan of God that though the people put Jehoahaz, who was the second in line of the throne, on the throne, uh, he was, he's removed within three months. And Jehoiakim, his brother, is put on the throne, and that is a utter disaster. It would have been a disaster with Jehoahaz, but it's an utter disaster with Jehoiakim on the throne. It's almost as though God is hastening the judgment. He's taken Josiah out of the way. He says, well, I've removed you. I waited patiently for 13 years. I removed you, and I removed you because I didn't want you to see the terrible things that will overtake your people. Your friend Jeremiah is going to see them, and they're going to break his heart, but you're not going to see them. Because you did so much to try and turn this people around. I don't want you to have the disappointment of seeing the end result of all of that labour that you put in. I'm going to take you away. So God's taking him away. It's almost as though God is saying, well, now that I've taken him away, let's get this over and done with. Let's bring the end. And so he takes Jehoahaz, who might have been better, but he would have been better than Jehoiakim, and puts the rotter, Jehoiakim, in power. So this place, Riblar, is the base of not only Nico's but Nebuchadnezzar's military operations in the years to come. It says that he might not reign in Jerusalem. So he took, he took him out. Uh, he was considered a dubious vassal by Nico and he is taken off to die in oblivion. Now this is Unger's, this is Unger's uh, description of what happened at this time. Nico was an ally of Assyria. He writes this, Upon Ashurbanipal's death in 633 BC, the Assyrian Empire declined rapidly. In 612 BC, Nineveh fell under attack by a coalition of Babylonians, Medes and Scythians. A remnant of the Assyrian army fled west to Haran and made it a temporary capital. The king of Egypt, Pharaoh Necho, accordingly, came to help the Assyrian remnant and their king, Asher Rebelet, who stood at bay for several years at Carchemish under the combined attacks of the Medes and the Babylonians. But of course the battle of Carchemish was ultimately fought, the, the conclusive battle, and that was the end of the Assyrian Empire because Nebuchadnezzar swept all before him. And then of course, 606, we know what happens, Daniel and his friends are take, taken off into captivity in Babylon and the rest we know well. So what about this three-month reign of Jehoahaz, the second oldest son of Josiah? His name means Yahweh seized. Another misnomer, isn't it? He was certainly not Yahweh seized in the positive sense, but I think you could say he was Yahweh seized in the negative sense, because God did seize hold of this man through Pharaoh Necho and cart him off into Egypt. He was 23, 23 years of age when he came to the throne. His mother, Hamutal, father-in-law of Jew, rather strange name. And the people preferred Jehoahaz, the younger, to Jehoiakim, as I said, uh, he, who was the rightful heir to the throne, because the characters of these two men were well known. 
Their behaviour, their attitudes were well known and they thought that Jehoahaz was seen to be the lesser of two evils. It's terrible when you've got to make a choice between the lesser of two evils, isn't it? But that's all they had. He was followed, of course, by Jehoiakim, whom we call the arrogant tyrant. And that's exactly what he was. He was to reign for 11 years from 608 to 597. He was 25 years old when he came to the throne in the, in the wake of the removal of Jehoahaz, his brother. His mother, he had a different mother to his brother. His mother was Zebudah, gainfulness. And the, the utter malevolence of Jehoiakim is highlighted in the record of the kings in just two incidents. That's, that's all we get. We don't get much of a glimpse of this man except these two incidents. Firstly, his harsh exaction of tribute because Pharaoh Necho laid a, a tax, a tribute upon the land and Jehoiakim had to fund this somehow so he, he went around and harshly taxed his own people without consideration for the poor and needy they all had to pay their, 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 their sum and he didn't have any consideration for those who were more well off against those who were less well off. He was a cruel, heartless tyrant. And secondly, of course, there was his treachery in his dealings with Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. He would make commitments and then break them. Now, a key reference here is Jeremiah 22. I'd like you to come to, to Jeremiah 22 and have a look at the character of, in fact, three men in Jeremiah 22. This chapter begins in verses 1 to 3 with a call to righteousness. And that call to righteousness is made with Jehoiakim's evil ways in view. So let's read the first three verses of Jeremiah 22. Thus saith Yahweh, Go down to the house of the king of Judah and speak there this word. And say, Hear the word of Yahweh, O king of Judah, that sittest upon the throne of David. Thou and thy servants and thy people that enter in by these gates. Now the, the, the king sitting upon the throne at the time is Jehoiakim. Thus said Yahweh, Execute ye judgment and righteousness and deliver the, and deliver the spoiled out of the hand of the oppressor. And do no wrong. Do no violence to the stranger, the fatherless, nor the widow. Neither, let shed, neither shed innocent blood in this place. All of those things were happening. Now we know what pure religion is, don't we? Yeah. James tells us what pure religion is. Well, he's doing the exact opposite. And the exact opposite to the example of his father. So when you come to verses 10 to 12, you have an exhortation to, these, to the people who are observing the evil ways of Jehoiakim and then God turns his attention to his younger brother who's now down in Egypt, languishing in Egypt. And, they, and the people were saying, oh wow, what have we got here in Jehoiakim? We would have been better off with Jehoahaz. Look what he says in verse 10. Weep ye not for the dead, neither bemoan him. That's Josiah. But weep sore for him that goeth away. That's Jehoahaz going into Egypt. For he shall return no more, nor see his native country. For thus saith Yahweh touching Shalom, the son of Josiah. This is Jehoahaz, king of Judah, which reigned instead of Josiah his father, which went forth out of this place, taken away by Pharaoh Necho up to Riblah and then to Egypt. He shall not return thither any more. But he shall die in the place whither they have led him captive, and shall see this land no more. In other words, here are people who are, who are miserable because Jehoah has only reigned for three months and he would have been a better deal than Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim was an absolute rotter. And they're weeping. Well, why do we have to have this king? We could have had... And God says, forget it. Forget it. And I didn't weep for Josiah. That, that man in Egypt's not coming home. And he is like you. You're gone. You're going to captivity. And many of them ended up in Egypt, didn't they? They were led down there at the end of the, of the disastrous events. And even Jeremiah was taken down there. And most of them died down there, like Jehoahaz. So he's really, he's really a type 
of a multitude that would end up in the same place and with the same destiny. Then you come to verses 13 to 15, and God turns to Jehoiakim's unrighteousness. Verse 13. Woe unto him that buildeth his house by unrighteousness, and his chambers by wrong, that useth his neighbour's service without wages, and giveth him not for his work. So Jehoiakim was noted, you know, he wasn't going to, I mean, he's king. He wasn't going to live in some kind of, of old palace that hadn't been refurbished. So he's going to build a new one. So he starts building a new palace. And he gets the people who are impoverished by the heavy taxation he's imposed upon them to come and work in his palace. And he doesn't pay them any wages. Anybody here would go to work without wages? Well, no, of course you wouldn't. But he made people work without wages. That's the kind of attitude he had. And we read on in verse 14. That saith, that, that saith I will build me a wide house and large chambers and, and cutteth him out windows and it is sealed with cedar and painted with vermilion. What that really means in our language is he got the very best that was available at the time. Just like some people do today. They get the very best. And you walk into their place and think, oh, I don't want to touch anything. You know, that's what he was like. And he wasn't paying anybody for it. Verse 15. Shalt thou reign because thou closest thyself in cedar? Did not thy father, namely Josiah, did not Josiah eat and drink and do judgment and justice? And then it was well with him. So Josiah was not only a reformer, he was a man of integrity. He dealt with integrity with his people. And you know, there's something very important about that, brethren. You can be the most magnificent Bible student, the most magnificent reformer, but if you're not acting with integrity in every aspect of your life, it's pointless. Because you're not like your God. And Josiah had one aim. He wanted to be like his God. So he acted with purity and integrity of heart. It's what we must aim at. That's the whole point, isn't it, of our Bible reading and meditation and study. We want to end up thinking and acting like our God. So that's the lesson that comes to me out of that. This awful story of Jehoiakim has this wonderful, beautiful contrast in the life and integrity of his father who gave himself wholly for his people. He would have done anything. He would have given his life to redeem his people. And of course that points forward to the man that we're going to consider very shortly in, our, in this session and in our exhortation this morning. Look at Jeremiah 23 verses 1 to 6. This is, this is the way our God works. I mean, Jer Jeremiah 22 is the miserable story of the evil progeny of Josiah. And of course, it's not too long and you've got Jehoiachin for three months, ten days as king. He's carted off. And then you've got Zedekiah for another 11 years. I wonder why Jehoiakim is 11 and Zedekiah is 11, eh? 11 is the number of inadequacy and failure. And that's what they were. But look at what God presents in the next chapter of Jeremiah as a contrast. In verses 1 to 6. Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my, of my pasture. Men like Jehoiakim, the shepherd, the teacher. Therefore thus saith Yahweh Elohim of Israel against the pastors that feed my people. Ye have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings. I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries whither I have driven them and will bring them again to their folds and they shall be fruitful and increased. And I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them and they shall fear no more nor be dismayed neither shall they be lacking, saith Yahweh. This is a reference, brethren, to the work of the saints in the future. A work that they will do both with Christ in the land, with the third that come through the fire, and with the scattered Jews outside the land with Elijah. That's what that's referring to. So when men like Jehoiakim and Jehoahaz and others 
were destroying and scattering God's flock by their evil ways, there were people like Josiah and others who surrounded him who have to wait for a better day. And they're going to wait for this day when they will be the pastors. Now you see this word pastors in verse 2 and in verse 1. That, that word is reah in the Hebrew. It means a shepherd or a teacher. And in verse 4 he says, I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them. That word feed is the same Hebrew word as the word for pastors. It has the idea of shepherding and feeding. And that's, this clearly is a reference to the work that awaits us in the future. But it's actually verses 5 and 6 that I want in this chapter. Because here's the principal shepherd. Here is the shepherd of the flock. Verse 5. Behold, the days come, saith Yahweh, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. Not like Jehoiakim, but like Josiah. Execute judgment and judgment in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name whereby he shall be called. And there's a play. There's a play here on names, isn't there? He will be called, as the margin has it, Yahweh Sekendu. Now, Yahweh our righteousness. That's the meaning of the name Zedekiah. That's what Zedekiah's name means. And so what we're being told here is that when God is disposed of the evil progeny of Josiah, the last of which is Zedekiah, whose name is a misnomer, there will be no king until he come, whose right it is, and I will give it him. He will be truly a Zedekiah, a Yahweh Zidkenyu, Yahweh our righteousness. That's a wonderful prophecy, isn't it? When you see it in contrast to what was happening under the, under the guidance of Josiah's evil progeny. And here's another one, his grandson, Jehoiachin. So when Jehoiakim dies the death and has the burial of an ass and his body is cast outside the gates of Jerusalem, he's replaced by his son, Jehoiachin, the helpless. And he's there just for three months and ten days. His name means Yahweh will establish. That doesn't turn out to be true, does it? But it does turn out to be true. He's taken away to Babylon, this man. And because he did at least submit to Nebuchadnezzar, and he's go he goes off to Babylon, which of course Jeremiah appeals to his people to do. He appeals to Zedekiah to give up, to go out to the king of Babylon. And if you do that, you'll secure your life, and you'll go to Babylon, and I'll give you some comfort there and some peace there. Well, at least he did that. And as a result of that, you know what happens to this man, Jehoiachin, in due time? He's exalted in Babylon by a man called Evil Merodach. All right? He's exalted and he's given the privileges of a vassal king in Babylon. And this is the preparation of the ground, of course, for the continuing line of David through Zerubbabel. And Zerubbabel and Joshua the high priest bring back the remnant of 50-odd thousand uh, in 536 B.C., after they've done their 70 years captivity from 606 to 536. And they come back, of course, under the decree of Cyrus. And we know that all of that is a wonderful type of the work of our Lord Jesus Christ, the overthrow of Babylon by the Son of Righteousness and the drying up of the great river Euphrates, which we're watching now as Turkey gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And we're seeing all of these things happen, all prefigured so wonderfully in the work of Cyrus whom Yahweh calls my shepherd in Isaiah 44 and 45. I mean, that's just another, that's another big story which we can't deal with here this weekend. So the premature death of Jehoiakim allowed only this brief respite from the oppression, oppressions of his reign because the 18-year-old son, Jehoiachin, ascends the throne, pursued the same basic policies as his wicked father, and was removed by God, but is ultimately exalted in Babylon as the basis for the recovery of the nation. Now, I'm not going to say too much about Zedekiah. It's a huge study, as Brother Phil Bell pointed out recently in, uh, in Seattle. It is a huge 
study. So we're not going to do very much at all about Zedekiah. Just to basically summarise uh, the, the terrible last 11 years of Judah's history. He was another son of uh, Josiah. His mother's name was Hamutal. So he's, uh, he's a, what, a full brother to Jehoiakim? Have I got that right? Full brother to Jehoiakim? His name means, as I said, the right of Yah, the justice of Yah, or the righteousness of Yah. There's that play on, on that in Jeremiah 23, as we've seen. And a clear picture of this man's character emerges from the record. He followed the ways of Jehoiakim. We're told that in 2 Kings 24, verse 19. And was just as treacherous as his older brother in his dealings with Nebuchadnezzar. They could not be relied upon. You know, and there's, there's references we could take you to about the, the oaths that Zedekiah made and which he broke almost straight away. He was not a man of integrity. You could not rely upon this man. If he made some kind, he swore an oath using the divine name, he wouldn't keep it. This, this is like the first king of Israel. And we're going to talk about him in our exhortation this morning. Saul. He could not keep a promise. He made an oath or a vow. He could not keep it. And he never kept one in his life. And that was the oath that he made to the witch of Endor. And he didn't break that because he was dead the next day. Right? Saul couldn't keep an oath or a promise to help himself. And that was the character of the last king of Judah as well. Well, when he's put aside, we're waiting for one who kept every oath that he made and he did it in perfection and he will come and take the throne because it's his right to do that because of his character and behaviour there's the direct contrast made with Zedekiah so of course we know this passage don't we in Ezekiel 21 this is 25 to 27 we often use this and thou profane wicked prince of Israel directed at Zedekiah the last king of Judah whose day has come when iniquity shall have an end, thus saith the Lord Yahweh, remove the diadem, take off the crown, this shall not be the same. Exalt him that is low and abase him that is high. I will overturn, overturn, overturn it, and it shall be no more until he come whose right it is, and I will give it him. And if you don't have Elpis Israel, page 306, written in the margin of your Bible, I would suggest that you do it because you need to read it. Alright? Elpis Israel, page 306, is where Brother Thomas quotes on this, I will overturn, overturn, overturn it. So the next time you come across that, uh, that uh, reading in Ezekiel 21, it would be a good idea to get out Elpis Israel and read it out to your kids at the readings because it is well worth doing that. There are three overturnings here. Now I've given you a quotation from Brother Ron Abel's Rest of Scriptures. This is what he says and I don't have any reason to disagree with him. I think he's got this basically right. He wrote, I will overturn, overturn, overturn it. And of course the RSV translation uh, is ruin, ruin, ruin. So it's not so much about overturning something, it's about the ruin of a dynasty or, a, or a, a kingdom or at least some kind of, of, uh, of uh, authority to do with the Jews. He goes on to say, this overturning, overturning, overturning may be emphatic emphasis for the overturning by the Babylonians in the time of Zedekiah. In other words, the repetition is, is emphatic. Or it may refer to the three invasions by the Babylonians, Antiochus Epiphanes, the key, of course, being the king of the north at that time, and Titus, who overthrew Jerusalem in AD 70. And I don't think there's any reason to disagree with that, because, you see, uh, that, uh, that authority that was vested uh, in the Jewish nation came to its end, didn't it, fully, in AD 70. That was the end of Judah's commonwealth. That was where it ceased to operate and it's been set aside ever since. And I think that is probably a pretty good interpretation. Now how are we going? Well we've got a little while. Um, <coughs> I'm going to take you off in a direction now you didn't expect. 
Okay? I want you to have a look with me at the themes of Jeremiah. And the reason I'm doing this, it's quite calculated. I'm doing this because I want to lead us to our Lord Jesus Christ. And in our next session, our final session for this weekend, we'll be focusing very much on him as the rightful heir to David's throne. And we're going to be looking at some two wonderful aspects uh, in relation to Christ. So I want to lead you to that in the final uh, minutes of this session. So I want you to come with me to Jeremiah, and I think most of us are in Jeremiah. Maybe you're in Ezekiel, but come back to Jeremiah. I want to show you some of the themes of Jeremiah. Now this is a little exercise that if you really want to see something that's very helpful in the prophecy of Jeremiah, you can do this exercise. There is a theme that actually begins in chapter 3, but I'm going to pick it up from chapter 5 of Jeremiah. Now Jeremiah 5, of course, is the is Jeremiah's inspection of Jerusalem. And we're going to make a bit about that in a minute. It's his inspection of Jerusalem. And in chapter 7, of course, he's told to go and stand in the gate of the house of God and to declare certain things to this people. But the fabric of this context that goes on for chapter after chapter in Jeremiah is this word, visit. This is the golden thread that runs through this section of Jeremiah. And I would recommend you look this up, this word, as you can see on the screen there, the word visit, which you meet in Jeremiah 5 and verse 9, where he's just enumerated the evils of this nation. And you, you just cast your eye at verse 7. He talks there about how shall I pardon thee for this. And he lists off all of these things that they were doing, all these evils. They, they assembled themselves by troops in the harlot houses, they were like fed horses in the morning, everyone neighing after his neighbour's wife. It sounds like the modern world, doesn't it? But anyway, he says in verse 9, Shall I not visit for these things, saith Yahweh? And shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? So here's our word visit. It's going to dominate the following chapters of Jeremiah. We want to follow it through. Now, you don't need to, to highlight these now, but I'm going to show you the first you know, eight or nine or a dozen or so, just so you can see how, how prominent this idea is. This word visit means to, to muster, to number, and therefore to gather together for the sake of punishing, all right, doing something about the evils. There are 49 occurrences of this Hebrew word in the prophecy of Jeremiah right through the whole prophecy. We just read one recently, as I recall. There's also another related word. You can see with the word visit, pekad. Well, there's this word visitation, pekuda. It obviously comes from the first one. It means oversight, care, custody, mustering, visitation. Uh, and there are nine occurrences of that word in Jeremiah. Now, Isaiah, of course, picks up this same idea. You can see that quotation there on the left-hand side of the screen. Isaiah 10 verse 3 says, And what will ye do in the day of visitation, and in the desolation which shall come from far? So this is the idea of visitation in order, in order to desolate, to bring to an end something that's intolerable. There's also another thing. No, let me just, uh, don't worry about that screen for a while. I'm going to come back to that. I want to take you through these occurrences of visit. Turn the page to chapter 5, verse 29. Shall I not visit, there's our word, for these things? Have a look at verse 6 of chapter 6. For thus hath Yahweh of hosts said, Hew ye down trees and cast them out against the Jerusalem. This is the city to be visited. Chapter 6, verse 15, towards the end. At the time that I visit them, they shall be cast down. Uh, let's just run over to chapter 8 and verse 12, end of the verse. In the time of their visitation they shall be cast down. Chapter 9 verse 9, shall I not visit them for these things? Chapter 9 verse 25, behold the days come that I will punish, that word punish is actually that word pay cat, it means visit, the margin will tell you that. Uh, chapter 10 verse 15, in the time of their visitation they shall perish. End of chapter 11. Verse 22 of chapter 11. 
Therefore thus saith Yahweh of hosts, Behold, I will punish them. That's the word pekat, visit. End of, end of verse 23. The year of their visitation. And I can go on and on and on. There are 49 of them. Plus the nine. That's 58 references to visitation. You get a feel? It's a major theme of the prophecy of Jeremiah. Now I'm going to make something of this, so you know this is not just mechanical. Right? You, you can make something of it. That's very important to our Lord Jesus Christ. As is this theme, the theme of weeping in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 9 verse 1, you read this. Oh that my head were waters and mine eyes a fountain of tears. You get this idea of weeping all through Jeremiah. Chapter 13 and verse 17. We read. But if you will not hear it, my soul shall weep in secret places for your pride. And mine eyes shall weep sore and run down with tears because Yahweh's flock is carried away captive. Chapter 14 and verse 17. Therefore thou shalt say this word unto them, Let mine eyes run down with tears, night and day. You get a bit of an idea? And he goes on through Jeremiah. So it's another major theme. And of course, this is pointing to the time when our Lord Jesus Christ came to Jerusalem for the last time. And when he arrived, when he came near the city, he beheld the city and he wept over it. Guess what? He quotes... From Jeremiah, from this context where the word visit and visitation is used. I want to show you that. His mind is back here in Jeremiah. And there's a reason, another reason for that. There are many themes here. The theme of peace, peace when there is no peace. Look at chapter 6, verse 14. You don't need to look at chapter 8, verse 11, because it's exactly the same words repeated. But have a look at Jeremiah 6 and verse 14 and the surrounding words. I'm going to start from verse 11 of Jeremiah 6. Therefore I am full of the fury of Yahweh. I am weary with holding you. I will pour it out upon the children abroad and upon the assembly of young men together. For even the husband with the wife shall be taken and the age with him that is full of days. And their houses shall be turned unto others and their fields and wives together. For I will stretch out my hand upon the inhabitants of the land, saith Yahweh. For from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. And from the prophet, even to the priest... Everyone dealeth falsely. They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace! Peace! When there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed. Neither could they blush. Therefore they shall fall among them that fall. At the time that I visit them, they shall be cast down, saith Yahweh. Get a bit of an idea? You read exactly the same thing in chapter 8. It's repeated all over again. So, this is another theme of Jeremiah. Peace, peace, when there is no peace, because the time of visitation is coming upon them. 31 occurrences of Shalom in the book. Just a couple more little themes, dominant themes of Jeremiah, before we come to Luke 19. The word mount is used on three occasions. Jeremiah, I think we might be in Jeremiah 6. Let's have a look at verse 6 again. For thus hath Yahweh of hosts hew ye down trees and cast a mount. It means a siege mount. Okay, a siege mount against the city. Okay, so that's used three times. As is the destruction of families. In Jeremiah 6, 11, verse 11 and 12, which we just read, again in chapter 8, again in chapter 9, 14, 18 and 44, the message, the theme is the destruction and dissolution of families. So you got these themes right? Yeah? Well, we can uh, come along in a minute to Luke 19, but before we do, we need to stay in Jeremiah. You know the law of a leprous house, Leviticus 14, you know it very well. The owner of the house reports leprosy to the priest, Leviticus 14.35. This of course is 
is the equivalent of what happens here in Isaiah and Jeremiah. You know, we know in Isaiah 1 there's a reference to the whole body being sick, head to the foot, leprosy. Okay? So Yahweh warns of leprosy in his house through the prophets. He starts with Isaiah. And so when the time of Jeremiah comes, he orders the first inspection of the house. That's what happened in Leviticus 14, 36 to 37. The priests would come along and they, he would inspect the house. And Jeremiah begins his first inspection as a priest. He's a priest. He begins his first inspection of Yahweh's house in chapter 5 through chapter 7. This is why he's told to go and stand in the gate of the temple and declare the leprosy of this people. Now you, you want a you want proof that this is what he's doing? Come to chapter 7 of Jeremiah. I'm going to just give you one phrase out of Jeremiah 7. We haven't got time to go into that chapter. Verse 29 of Jeremiah 7 says this. Cut off thine hair, O Jerusalem. What did the leper do when he was healed? He shaved his whole body so he looked like a newborn babe. And he made a completely new beginning. Cut off thine hair from all of your body. So we know that the context is leprosy. So Jeremiah makes his first inspection of the house between chapters 5 and 7. Well, what happened then? Well, if it was seen or deemed to be leprous, it was shut up for seven days. So Jeremiah stands at the gate of the temple and he, he makes that appeal. Chapter 7, verse 2. Stand in the gate of Yahweh's house and proclaim there this word and say, Hear the word of Yahweh, ye that enter in by these gates to worship him. In other words, he's really saying you need to stop, pause and consider. We're going to lock this house up for seven days. He calls for the cleansing of lepers, as we saw in chapter 7 and verse 29. But you see, there was a second inspection of the house after seven days, wasn't there? Leviticus 14, 39. And Jeremiah, as the priest, makes his second inspection of the house between Jeremiah 16... And Jeremiah 29. Now you can read it for yourself. He makes his second inspection. And he finds it, sadly, leprous. So what do they do if after the second inspection the house was deemed to be leprous? Well, parts of the leprous house had to be taken to an unclean place. So they, you know, they, they took away the infected stones of the house. This, of course, is pointing to the removal of of stones, which of course we know biblically is about people, living stones, removal of stones to a, a place, an unclean place. And they went to Babylon and some went to Egypt, both of them unclean places. So what do they do with the house then? Well, they scraped it and the dust of that house was removed. This refers to Yahweh's judgment through the Chaldeans. This term dust, by the way, if you, if you actually do some digging around, it goes right back to Genesis 2 verse 7. The Yahweh made man out of the dust of the ground. And the word for scraped off is used in Leviticus 14.41, is rendered cut short in 2 Kings 10.32. Yahweh began to cut Israel short. So this is the result of the second inspection. The house is scraped and the dust removed. He's bringing judgment upon them through the Chaldeans. But they bring in new stones to repair the house, don't they? And of course, when they returned from Babylon, from the unclean place, they came back and they rebuilt the temple. They repaired the house. That was done by the returned captives in the time of Zerubbabel and Joshua. And they do, with, they, they, they do this with other mortar. It's the same word for dust, by the way. So there's a new generation associated with the temple in Ezra chapter 3 who rejoice even though the older people the older folk weep because they, they, they see no grandeur in this at all but sadly when they had rebuilt the temple the second temple period they call it as time went on the leprosy returns to the house and this of course refers to that period between 516 BC when the temple was completed and 30 AD, when our Lord Jesus Christ came for the third and final inspection of God's house. 
and he wasn't very happy with what he found. The third inspection by the priest, required by Leviticus 14 verse 44, was fulfilled by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. I want you to come to Luke 19. here at Luke 19 we pick the record up from verse 41 and when he was come near he beheld the city and he wept over it saying if thou hadst known even thou at least in this thy day the things which belong unto thy peace He's beginning to quote from Jeremiah. But now they are hid from thine eyes. Now that too is a quotation from Jeremiah, as I'll show you in a minute. For the day shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee. In other words, they'll build up a mound, a siege mound, and keep thee on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, families, are going to be decimated. And they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. And he starts the process, because it says in verse 45, And he went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold therein, and them that bought He begins the process that was to be completed in AD 70. We know what happened. Under the law, Leviticus 14.45, if the house on the third inspection was found to still be leprous, it had to be totally dismantled, stone by stone, and removed to an unclean place. And in AD 70, the Romans come along, they destroy Jerusalem and the temple, and the Jews are taken into captivity. That's what happened to this place. Because the third inspection by our Lord Jesus Christ found it to still be leprous. His mind is in Jeremiah. Luke 19.41, he beheld the city and wept over it. We saw those references to weeping in Jeremiah. 42, the things which belong to thy peace. We saw the reference to peace. Peace, peace, they were saying, when there was no peace. We saw that they were hid from their eyes. Jeremiah 5.21, it's well worth having in your margin. Jeremiah 5.21 says this. Hear now this, O foolish people, and without understanding, which have eyes and see not, which have ears and hear not, these things are hid from thine eyes. Verse 43, thine enemy shall cast a trench about, the allusion to Jeremiah 6, verse 6. Because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation, reference to that major theme of the prophecy of Jeremiah. That's brought us where we need to be, hasn't it? Now, this man who was weeping over the dreadful things that he found, which the suffering servant of Yahweh in the times of Josiah also found, Jeremiah the prophet, who shed tears over that place. And it had to be dismantled because of leprosy. Terrible story. But of course, there is a bright future, isn't there? As we saw, that nation which is leprous today is, sh- is shortly going to be healed, cured of leprosy in the forehead, leprosy in their thinking. And we are going to have a job to do. Which is why it's so important, brethren, that we build up our understanding and our knowledge of these things so that we are going to be prepared for a work, not only now in the few days that are left to us in our home ecclesias, but that we can be prepared for the work that's shortly to come. Won't it be terrific if Christ says to you, you're ready to go out as one of the pastors, one of the teachers, with Elijah the prophet. (laughs) I'd do anything to be there with Elijah the prophet, to have the opportunity to educate and to teach God's people his ways, wouldn't you?
BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is a worldwide collaboration by Christadelphians to help promote the understanding of God's Word to those who are seeking the truth about the human condition and God's plan and purpose with this earth and with mankind upon it. Bible Truth and Prophecy is part of a wider set of online resources provided by ChristadelphianVideo.org for establishing just how far removed the true Christian teaching of the first century apostles is from that taught by mainstream Christendom today. BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is very much a standalone website but benefits from our vast network of sites and resources and social media. Here are just a few of the things that BibleTruthAndProphecy.com offers. We have a good number of written articles supplied to us from brothers from all over the globe. These deal with first principle issues, creation versus evolution, the inspiration of the Bible and so much more. We have a whole section of video study series. These are studies that have been posted onto our YouTube channel but because of the difficulty of the search feature within YouTube we have chosen to host on Bible Truth and Prophecy. So now every video you search for within the site you can be guaranteed that it will be of a Christadelphian nature. We also have a preaching video section where any ecclesia is invited to download and use or embed these videos within their own ecclesial websites. We also have an exhortation service where we produce two or three exhortations per week which we then circulate to brethren and sisters in isolation. We also have an ever-growing list of approved Christadelphian sites. We also have a page of live news feeds so you can keep up to date with all the breaking news as it happens. We also have a section for the daily readings. Each day at around midnight we publish all three of the daily readings and then later on in the day we publish thought for the days often based on all three portions of the daily readings. Within each daily reading post there is also a link to enable you to have the Bible chapter read to you directly. We also feature Bible in the News videos, videos which we have produced from the Bible in the News website. We also feature Brother Don Pierce's Milestone Snippets which come out approximately three times a week. We also feature Andy Walton's Weekly World Watch and other commentaries and analysis from other brethren on world news events. You can also subscribe to the blog and be notified of posts as they happen in real time and also subscribe to the weekly newsletter which is provided by ChristadelphianVideo.org. Every page and post on the site has the facility to be able to leave a comment or make an observation. So please take advantage of this and let us know what you think of the site.